Hello, Mass Study students. Welcome to another online lesson. Today, we're going to talk about creating sign diagrams to interpret functions in their graphs. So I know for a lot of students, graphing is not one of their favorite things. It can be difficult, in fact, even using technology to come up with the correct windows uh, to see our functions properly. And so what we're going to use now is our derivatives to help us find key functions or key parts of a graph without actually having to make the graph itself, which can be very useful. So to start with, we have to review a little bit of terminology involving graphs. So we're going to start with maximum. Maximum would be the highest point on a graph. We see that on parabolas. Anytime that they have been, uh, if they have a negative a value or concave down, they're going to look like this. The maximum is going to be the very highest point on a graph. A relative maximum, however, is a point that's the highest on a graph within its given region. What I mean by that is if you have something like a cubic, like this graph, the highest point is actually going to approach infinity as, as we get higher and higher over here. But at this particular spot, you'll notice this point here is higher than everything immediately to its left and everything immediately to its right. And so it would be a relative or sometimes called a local maximum. A minimum, of course, is the lowest point on a graph. And we would see that on a parabola. It has a minimum value where nothing is higher than it. And then a relative minimum would be, again, a case of a cubic. If I go back to this previous graph here, this one has a relative minimum here, meaning that everything immediately to its left and immediately to its right, this is the lowest value here with that green point. However, if we follow that graph down, it is going to eventually get much lower than that minimum. So we say, again, it's a local minimum or a relative minimum. Um, but a lot of times they just refer to those as minimums, not the, the absolute minimum, but just a minimum on a graph. A point of inflection, some graphs don't have points of inflections, like lines don't have points of inflections, and parabolas don't have points of inflection. But if I go back to that cubic function, it does have a point of inflection. And that point of inflection occurs right when the graph switches from being concave down to concave up. The easy way to think about this is if you were, let's say, in a helicopter and you were looking down at this graph here as if it were a road. And as the car goes down the road, and I'll use the green to show the car going down the road, it would be turning its steering wheel to the right slightly, and then more and more and more until it gets to right about here. And then from that point on, it would turn the wheel to the left. So right at this spot here where I put the X, that is where we have a point of inflection where our concavity switched. You can also think of it as sort of like two parabolas sort of being stuck together. One is a parabola that goes downward like that, and then one is a parabola that goes upward like this, right where we made the switch from the downward parabola to the upward parabola. That's a point of inflection. A horizontal point of inflection is a point of inflection that occurs um, when the graph is horizontal or has a slope of zero, and then it goes back up like that. Or it could go the other direction. So you're going down, and then you flatten out, and then you continue to go down like that. These are both horizontal points of inflection. They would have a tangent to them that is essentially horizontal, meaning that it has a slope of zero. And that's what we're looking for there. So let's take a look at a graph where we can identify some of these from an actual IV problem. So in example one here, we're given a function. We want to write the intervals. Uh, given the graph of f of x, state the intervals from a to l in which f of x is increasing. So our function is increasing, meaning it has a positive slope. So our intervals would be, well, if we look at a to b, again, we read a graph from left to right. From a to b, I'm going down. And so that's not what we're looking for. But from b to c, I'm going up. And I continue going up all the way until I get to d. And so that would be our first interval from b to d. Then we go down from d through e all the way to g. And then we go back up from g all the way until we get to k. And then we stop going up. And so that interval would be from 
g to k. And then for a brief moment at k, we level out. And so right at k, the slope is technically not increasing. It's technically 0. And then after that, we start increasing again till o. So k to o. Now, it might be tempting to say we're increasing from g straight through o, but it's not true. Right at k, we're not increasing. Now, decreasing, those would be the intervals that I left black. And so that would be from a to b and d to g. And again, those would be spots with negative slopes, and that's, those are also spots where our derivative would have a negative output or a negative value. Now we want to talk about a maximum value. Our maximum value occurs at d. It is both the absolute maximum as well as a relative maximum because it's immediately it's higher than anything immediate to its left or its right, and it's also the highest overall point on the graph. Um, a point that is a minimum value would be b, which is a relative minimum, and then g, which is both a relative and an overall minimum. Last but not least, the name given to point k where the gradient is 0. So gradient meaning slope. So its slope right here at k is 0. And it is a horizontal inflection point. Inflection either spelled with a C or with an X on IB, they do that a lot, uh, inflection point. Now, what does this have to do with derivatives? Well, being able to identify all those points on that last graph, it's pretty easy when the graph's in front of you, but again, you would need to have the graph. You would either need to draw it or get technology to give you that graph. What we want to do with derivatives is actually come up with uh, sign diagrams, which allow us to get all that information without having to make the graph. So um, we're mostly interested in something called stationary points. Stationary points, they call stationary because it has a rate or a slope of zero. Well, what things have a slope of zero? Um, again, if I was an increasing graph and then I flatten out, Right when I get horizontal here, that's what we call a stationary point. Now, if I continue down, that would have been a maximum. So the slope before the maximum was positive. The slope after the maximum was negative. But right there, when my derivative or my slope is 0, I have a maximum. Or I could have a minimum, where again, that slope right there would be 0. Before it, it would be negative. After it would be positive. Um, and then the last case would be that horizontal inflection point, where right for one moment the slope is zero, but before it, it was positive. After it, it's also positive. Um, any place that our derivative is greater than zero is what we call an increasing interval. Any place that our derivative is less than zero, we call a decreasing interval. So a sine diagram is what we're going to learn how to make. It's useful for identifying those stationary points, as well as knowing where we have increasing and decreasing intervals. Now, how do we create a sign diagram? Again, we create a sign diagram in lieu of a graph. It means that we don't have to make the graph in order to see what's going on. First step is find the derivative. Our second step is set the derivative equal to 0, and then solve for whatever variable you have. We plot the zeros on a number line, and I don't mean the number 0, I mean the spots that make our derivative equal to 0. And then we fill in plus and minus signs to identify intervals where the answer is either positive or negative. Any spot on our side diagram where we go from positive to negative, that is a maximum because it means that we increased and then we decreased. So we must have had a maximum there. Any place that we have a minimum would be where we go down, decrease, and then go up. And so once again, that must have been a minimum. And horizontal inflections occur whenever we go down and then more down, or up and then more up. So we're going to create a sign diagram and find the intervals where the graph increases 
or decreases and identify any stationary points. Once again, stationary points are things like maximums, minimums, and horizontal inflections. So what's our first step? We need to do our derivative. So that should just take us a couple seconds. Y prime is equal to negative three X squared plus six X and the five goes away. So once we've done our derivative, we then set the derivative equal to zero. So I have negative three X squared plus six X equals zero. Now I need to solve this. This is a quadratic. In order to solve a quadratic, we either need to use the quadratic formula or graph it on a calculator or factor it. Um, I will show you two methods. I will show you the factoring method first, and then I'll show you the quadratic formula. To start with here, I'm going to factor. There's only two terms. They both have a 3 and an x in common. And so I'm going to pull out um, a I can pull out the negative as well. So I'm going to pull out a negative 3x, and that leaves me with an x minus 2 in there. Again, if I were to distribute back, I would be back to where I, I started, negative 3x squared and positive 6x. Now that I've factored it, I take each of those factors and set them equal to 0. Again, this is all stuff just from, whoops, let me try that again. This is all stuff just from freshman, sophomore, junior years. So there's one of my factors, and my other factor is x minus 2, and I can set that equal to 0. So if I divide both sides by negative 3 here, I get x equals 0, and that is one of my solutions. The other spot I could go is add 2 over here, and I get x equals 2. That's my other stationary point or solution to this where the derivative equals 0. So that would be a factoring method. Uh, if we use the quadratic formula, that says x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. It's in your formula packet. We use this a lot during our algebra courses freshman, sophomore year. So x equals the opposite of b. Well, if we go back to this equation here, b is the term that's in front of the x, so that would be 6. So we'd have negative 6 plus or minus the square root of 6 squared, which again is our b, so that becomes 36 minus 4 times our a, which is the negative 3, it's in front of the x squared term, times our c, which we don't have one, it's 0, all over 2 times our a term, which again was negative 3. So as we clean this up, we have negative x equals negative 6 all over, this cancels out because it's 0, so I just have the square root of 36, so it's negative 6 plus or minus 6 all over negative 6. Well, if I make it positive, that would be negative 6 plus 6 all over negative 6. And negative 6 plus 6 cancel out, leaving 0. And that's one of the answers that I had gotten over here. So that's another way to get it. Or we can have x equals negative 6 minus 6 all over negative 6, which equals negative 12 over negative 6. And negative 12 divided by negative 6 gives me 2, which was the other answer I had here. So these are both fine ways to solve quadratics, uh, as well as graphing it on your calculator. Now, if it looked like that quadratic formula was a lot of work, the quadratic formula is always the same amount of work, which, you know, is those four or five steps that it took me there. Uh, factoring is often the easier way, but that's the stuff that we, the students, sometimes forget or don't like to do as much for some reason. Anyway, so we did two steps of our uh, sign diagram. We did our derivative. We set it equal to zero. The third step says make a number line just like this and plot your numbers on there. It's as simple as this. I put a zero. I put a two. Where did those come from? Again, those were the two roots or solutions that I had when I set my derivative equal to zero. And now what we need to do is check values in all these ranges. So we have a value of uh, answers that are less than 0, between 0 and 2, and greater than 2. So I get to pick my favorite number that's anywhere in this region, which is less than 0. I'm going to pick negative 1. I'm going to go back to my derivative here and plug in a negative 1. So I have negative 3 times negative 1 squared plus 6 times negative 1. Well, negative squared becomes positive, so I have negative 3 minus 6, which equals negative 9. Well, I don't even really care what the answer is as long as I know what the sign is. 
and it is definitely negative down here. So I just plot a negative for that region. So I know that the slope of any values less than x, I'm sorry, less than x equals 0, um, are negative. So my graph started off clearly going down. Now at 0, I know the slope was 0 because that's what I did with my derivative here. I set the derivative equal to 0. And now I want to know what happens in between 0 and 2. So I can pick any number between 0 and 2. My favorite one to plug in would be 1. So it'd be the exact same work that we just did, except instead of a negative 1, I use a positive 1. So I have negative 3 times 1 squared plus 6 times 1, which gives me negative 3 plus 6, which gives me positive 3, which is a positive answer. So now I can mark that on my sign diagram because I plugged in a number between 0 and 2, and it was positive. Last but not least, we pick a value greater than 2, like 3 or 5 or 10 or whatever your favorite number is there. I'm going to use 10. So I have negative 3 times 10 squared plus 6 times 10. And remember, we don't actually have to do all the work. We just have to know, is it going to be positive or negative? negative. And I can see right away it's going to be negative because I'll end up having 10 squared, which is 100. 100 times negative 3 plus 6 times 10. Well, 6 times 10 is only 60. And here I have negative 300. When I add those together, I'm definitely going to have a negative answer because negative 300 is much uh, larger than positive 60 as far as its absolute value goes. So we have a negative value there. So that means our graph was going down, then it went up, and then it went down again. So that means when x equals 0, we must have had a minimum. And then as we went up, we got up to where x equals 2. And then after that, we went down. And you can see that on my graph here. So that means that x equals 2 must have been a maximum. And I did that all without graphing. Now, of course, I just sketched a little graph here, but it's not an accurate graph of any kind. It just shows me that that's the overall shape of my graph. Again, it was going down, then it was going up, and then it was going down again. And I can use that to help decide um, what critical values or stationary points I had. We want to take a look at some of the book work we have on page 589 and 593. And we will talk more about this next time. Till then.